Hello, and welcome to Lens, the podcast brought to you by British Screen Forum. My name is John Gisby, and I'm delighted that you're listening. Welcome back, if you've listened before, and a particular thank you if you've sent feedback on our first two episodes via lens at britishscreenforum.co.uk or on social media. It's really great to hear that these conversations are useful and informative. Welcome also to anyone listening for the first time. We're creating these podcasts to help ensure that upcoming debates about the future of public service broadcasting are as well informed as possible by insights from the people who've built what we have today. In the first episode, I was joined by John Whittingdale, who reflected on his views on the importance of PSB and the policy debates that he helped shape in government. In episode two, we heard from David Abraham, ex-chief executive of Channel 4, who presented what one British Screen Forum member has since described as a masterclass in how to think not just about the future of public service broadcasting, but more broadly about the critical relevance of this debate to the future of the wider UK creative economy, the interplay, as David put it, between creative risk, cultural capital and business, before going on to describe what he thinks is the intellectual dishonesty of those who are assaulting the BBC in Channel 4. In this episode, we're joined by Mark Thompson, one of the titans of public service broadcasting from the last 30 years and the longest serving Director General of the BBC of the last 45 years. A runner up, I think, only to Lord Reith and one or two others in the length of time that he held senior positions at the heart of our biggest public service broadcaster. Mark joined us from his home in the US where he reflected on the challenges he faced in helping the BBC tackle digital switchover and the launch of on-demand services that transformed the market and also his views on what should happen next, following his experience in leading the digital transformation of the New York Times as its CEO. As ever, we hope that you find these conversations informative and enjoyable, and that you'll head to britishscreenforum.co.uk if you're interested in finding out more about what we do and in becoming a member. Uh, we are delighted, or I am delighted today, to be joined by Mark Thompson, uh, whose long and illustrious career has included some of the most important roles in UK broadcasting, uh, starting BBC Journalism, uh, including time as editor of the Nine O'Clock News and then Panorama, before becoming successively head of Features and Factual and Nations and Regions, controller of BBC Two and then director of television, before undertaking leadership roles that saw him as CEO of Channel Four and then returning for eight years as director general of the BBC. Uh, most recently, he was president and CEO of the New York Times and widely credited uh, with its successful transformation by focusing on digital content and propositions and new business models. Uh, and commentators have noted he's been accused of everything from dumbing down and uh, to highbrow elitism uh, and both believing uh, believing in PSB and being a passionate advocate for it without being boring, um, both of which I hope augur well for today. Um, uh, <laughs> Mark, delightful to, to, to have you join us. Uh, I must admit, I'm, I'm mildly intimidated uh, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with you, uh, widely regarded as one of the great intellects of, of public service broadcasting, uh, while my head is filled with the tail end of, of the fog of COVID. So we'll see how this goes. Um, I've, been, I've been more alert than I am right now, but we'll, we'll see how we get on. Um, the purpose of these discussions, uh, which we're having uh, in the over the course of the spring, um, is really to take up, I think, from the exhortation that uh, that you gave in the Steve Hewlett Memorial Lecture in 2019, where you said very memorably, it's time to glance out to see that grey band on the horizon as a tsunami. And really the focus of these conversations is to focus less on the how, because the how may change, but really to start with the why, because unless we really focus on the why it matters and what it is, uh, the risk is we end up with the wrong solutions and, and unintended consequences. So we're going to start with an easy one. What is public service broadcasting and why does it matter? Well, maybe I can start with a, um, a, an analogy. Um, you know, the, 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 the world is full um, of bookshops and actually bookshops are going through a pretty good time and uh, there are people making good money from selling books. Um, in most developed democracies, we also have a very strong tradition of public libraries. And... Public libraries doesn't mean that you don't need bookshops, but a public library has got slightly different objectives from a bookshop. In the end, a bookshop may well be run by people who love books. They're vital to authors. They're a big part of the way in which authors make their money and can go on writing. So the bookshops are very important, but a public library 
has got public purposes. It, its first purpose, or, or maybe its ultimate purpose, is to serve the public rather than to make money or do anything else. And to try and get books into the hands of everyone, not just those who've got the money to afford it or who already know they like books. And I think that public service broadcasting should be thought of like a bookshop or or like a museum um, uh, as a kind of share something shared in a community um, which has got purposes which go beyond commerce and the way in which much of the world's media works. Uh, going right back to the very beginning, um, uh, John Reith sort of spoke of the, the the unique property of the of the technology of broadcasting in terms of universal access to the to the home and the human brain, um, but but critically about making that available for everybody. Um, but that's right, and, and where everyone, it, 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 you know, the moment that the very early on that the idea of a license fee is settled upon, a kind of standard flat rate. Um, um, for the whole of the United Kingdom, this notion that, again, unlike, for example, a commercial subscription service, um, every household's worth the same. Um, you don't value, you know, you don't get more money by serving this household or this generation or this gender or whatever it is better than that one. It's a kind of, it, it's it's designed almost like another analogy, the water company to provide a service you know, at the tap, as it were, up and down the land. That's a very different conception of how you provide um, things like news and entertainment than, 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 than traditional models. It's quite a modern idea. And actually, weirdly, I often think that, you know, that the, the arrival of radio and radio broadcasting in the 1920s has got quite a lot in common with the arrival of the internet. Just in terms of the the, the wide the, the the widely available nature of the information, yeah, and with the particular economic property that the the serving of an additional marginal user doesn't require any more distribution cost. Um, basically, once you built your radio tower, you know anyone might as well listen to it because it's it's going out anyway. Now that's true of of of, of the internet. It's not true, for example, of printing newspapers. So, I mean, the, the, the broadest possible, I think Tony Hall once described it as being uh, bringing the best of everything to everybody um, as, a, as an overall core mission. Uh, it feels as though there's all sorts of barnacles that have come across that have sort of been aggregated on the model over the years in terms of um, uh, other policy objectives uh, that, that PSB has sort of uh, been, been down to deliver along the way. Um, to what extent are things like the role within the creative industries um, and kind of supporting the production sector uh, alongside, I mean, you, you had to wrestle with the broader broader objectives of delivering digital Britain, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, there's a risk that this becomes a sort of hobby horse to pin lots of other things on as time goes by. Yeah, I think there's two, I think there's two things going on, actually. One of which is, as it were, you know, um, there's kind of exogenous um, external pressures to do more. Um, and this could be because of public policy. I mean, for example, a great thing, which was the creation of an independent um, uh, production sector, essentially by the, the Thatcher government in the in the eighties. Um, and a second great thing, in my view, anyway, which is a real focus on spreading production and creative opportunities across the whole of the United Kingdom. And you could say the same, by the way, in in most other countries. Um, um, the, these kind of external public policy pressures, um, educational priorities, even such things as, you know, can you make people um, less likely to become obese by putting keep fit programs or healthy eating programs? There's, so at, you get kind of an external pull of, of, of other kinds of policy desiderata to kind of expand and spread the butter thinner to deliver those things. I want to say it's certainly true of the BBC that the BBC, even before the Second World War, is already beginning to interpret um, its 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 kind of mission towards universality. To me, it kind of had better have a finger in every pie. It's better, you know, when the TV comes along, the BBC is leaning into that and has has got its first TV service going in 1936, um, uh, for example. Um, um, but the same with breakfast TV, rather controversially in the 1980s, 
uh, the same in multi-channel TV, uh, late 80s through 90s and, and thereafter. The same with the internet, very early website in 1996. So there's there's a there's a real sense that the of, of a the BBC is not actually it's not a complacent organization it's a very nervy organization which is tempted is always wanted to kind of get in quickly to demonstrate it wasn't being left behind wasn't becoming obsolete wasn't getting kind of um, landlocked with its existing media so the the, the 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 tradition of the BBC getting into new media starts in thirty six um, getting into global media starts roughly the same time with the the launch of the Empire Service, which becomes the World Service. So, you know, you can see in the in the organization's history a internal instinct, which honestly is not to do with external pressure, but is actually to do with the, the BBC sense of itself, that it better expand, it better prove it can be as good as the new stuff, as the old stuff. Otherwise, it'll become in the end an irrelevance. I'll come back to some of those themes because I think that the, the issue about universality and scope is, is a kind of uh, really, really interesting one to tease out shortly. Um, Ofcom over the years has, uh, I think, fueled by ex-BBC strategists, I suspect, uh, laid out some pretty clear criteria as to what pu- good public service content looks like um, in terms of the objectives that it's trying to reach. Uh, so inform, educate and entertain, um, the, the old triumvirate, in terms of its range, its standards, its quality, uh, its its stimulus of, of cultural identity and, and appetite for knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Interestingly, the, the, it strikes me that the trade-off has, has been central to Ofcom's remit from the start, in the sense that they have to balance the the rights and interests of consumers as viewers, um, but also the rights and interests of citizens, um, and uh, and within that, the role that content uh, can play. How much of those sorts of debates and that sort of thinking were day-to-day um, parts of the conversation, particularly around commissioning decisions? Well, I mean, honestly, and, 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 and in a day job where where, where channel commissioners are, are are clearly having to make sense of ratings and uh, and reach, how do you then layer the public impact on top of that? Sure, there's there's but there's I think there's two 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 sort of that there, there have turned out to be two tensions in the system. One is the one you you basically you point to, which is how much kind of strictly come dancing versus. Um, uh, uh, um, you know, um, Shakespeare from the Royal Shakespeare Company on BBC Four. What's the balance between um, obviously high-minded, you know, capital P public service broadcasting, and the kind of quality mass entertainment which the BBC has in fact done pretty much from day one? How do you strike that balance? I mean, I think that that balance, if you accept it's a balance, which I, I guess I'm, most days I do. Um, I think it's just part of the part of you know if, if Ofcom didn't exist, the BBC would be in the court of public opinion trying to strike the right you know sense of value to every household, something that everyone can relate to, versus market failure arguments about certain genre like religious programming and arts programming and serious documentary. That's always with us, but actually, the the truth is. That in the UK, and by the way, this is true in Germany, it's true in France, uh, in, in most other countries with public broadcasters, there's been another straightforward tension, which is between um, uh, um, what's the right uh, balance to strike between the public service broadcasters' um, remit and scope and budget and its supposed or real impact on commercial media. And actually, that second tension and the lobbying and the um, ideological kind of penumbra of free market debates about do you need any of this stuff anymore? And and uh, surely this is just market impact in the age of Netflix. You don't need it anymore. You can trace a line from Alan Peacock to Nadine Doris on, on that second front. And actually, I think one of the perversities of the way the thing has played out in the UK and elsewhere is this second tension, which is frankly slightly inside baseball, really. Um, uh, There's very little evidence um, that the UK media sector has been adversely impacted by the BBC's scale and scope or Channel 4's scale and scope. I've never seen a convincing evidence of significant damage. And actually... Arguably, the BBC's had one of the strongest uh, 
uh, um, uh, uh, media sectors and media export sectors um, in, for example, Europe, um, um, despite the, the um, possibly because of the existence of these public broadcasters. But I think this second debate has been the one that's obsessed British politicians, particularly when con- the Conservatives are in power, because the Conservatives often are very, um, um, what's the word, credulous um, and willing to listen to um, um, free market and, frankly, straightforwardly self-interested perspectives from newspaper proprietors and, you know, um, uh, to, to a lesser extent, but a non-insignificant extent, commercial broadcast and so forth. So, actually, I think that although often an attack will come, even today, on too many repeats or uh, uh, not sufficiently distinctive programming on BBC One, I hear less and less of that. Um, I think we're dealing with a long war which started in the 1980s. Um, and so it's not 20 or 30, but really now, you know, um, uh, uh, many decades um, about, about um, which is a classic ideological um, debate about to what extent do you need public provision? To what extent should you let the market provide choice and provide quality? And the twist now is the streamers. Essentially, what's freshened up that debate a little bit is the fact that you've now got global streamers who are producing very high quality content, content which I think historically wouldn't exist much of it had it not been for the presence of the public broadcasters and the tradition of high quality drama that, it, that it, you know, the foresight saga, uh, 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 jewel, in the, jewel in the Crown and so on, which uh, um, uh, Brideshead revisited and, and Smiley's people and so on and so forth which make, makes the crown possible in terms of craft and pacing and ambition. But no, sure, Netflix and Amazon now are, are used now as the to, to underline the question marks about do these institutions, does this whole idea of PBS still have any value or not? And yeah, in that, uh, in that context, at some point does the needle shift that the consumer is now able to access um, uh, uh, that kind of quality content, offer it, often UK originated, made by UK producers. Um, so the essentially the forcing mechanism, particularly in the context of the license fee, the forcing mechanism of forcing households to to pay um, becomes in um, Michael Grobe was, was uh, quoted recently, I think um, uh, I think it was on the Today program fairly recently, saying it fundamentally it is a regressive tax. Um, at, at what point does that balance shift, if at all? Well, if it shifts, and I think I think. Uh, if, if, as it were, we get to a some kind of um, tipping point, um, um, I would say let's not jump ahead to the license fee. In the end, that's a that's a kind of um, device. Um, maybe it's no longer the right device. I mean, it, there's a kind of fiscal set of questions about, as you say, regression versus you know some sort of you know other other way of a percentage on um, council tax, or there are, there are other ways of of, of 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 dealing with the kind of fiscal MacGuffin of how you actually pay for the BBC. To me, the heart of it is audiences, and I, I think I said that in the in the speech you mentioned, the um, the the Steve Hewlett speech. If if you end up with a generation of people who do not consume um, um, the services of the BBC or Channel Four. Um, um, either because the content is not relevant to them or because the there is a mismatch between the, the, the media distribution channels on which the most of the content is being provided by the public broadcasters and the media channels and devices that these, these users are actually using and making part of their lives. Put very crudely, if you're stuck too heavily in conventional linear broadcasting and everyone under the age of 40 is largely watching and listening asynchronously on mobile devices or on streaming services. So you're no longer providing a universal service de facto. That, to me, is the the fact that somebody's still whinging to the Secretary of State and the Secretary of State um, who's trying to make a, a name for her, himself or herself is is babbling away about market failure is not the reason for the tipping point. Um, the, 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 the heavy lift of essentially destroying the BBC 
the political heavy lift is colossal. And honestly, um, the UK, in common with other countries, has basically been in crisis since 2008 on far, far more weighty matters than broadcasting. And it might, it might take you 10 or 20 years to get on the agenda, let alone to the moment when you want to expend the political capital to actually kind of get rid of the BBC or to destroy it by getting rid of its licence. You know, I think the way in which Secretary of State Nadine Doris was slapped down recently after her remarks about this will be the last charter and blah, 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 um, it was a good illustration of that. No, the real to me the real risk is is losing your audience because you haven't moved fast enough to change uh, and to adapt what you do to audience services. Historically, the BBC in particular was very adept. It changed all sorts of things. Um, in you know, it, it introduced television very very early indeed. Arguably, the 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 earliest television service in the world. It in the nineteen sixties changed its content very bravely to reflect a, an incoming younger generation and went through a lot of flack, which is Mary Whitehouse and the rest of it, to, 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 to take a bet on the future. Um, it was a very early adopter, both of digital, the BBC Micro, and of the internet, the B- BBC online service, as I said, in ninety six. The game gets faster, though. I mean, it's like a video game. Each level is, is kind of quicker and faster and harder than the last one. And... Uh, the BBC needs to move faster, Channel 4 needs to move faster, and ITV, insofar as you think of it as a public service broadcaster, needs to move faster. And I think my frustration has been over the last decade or so that actually my sense has been of insufficient pace in keeping up, not with public policy, but with audiences and what with the, the way people are actually consuming media. That, that To me, if you lose your audience... At that point, you really are, and frankly, should be um, um, subject to um, profound political scrutiny and and ultimately to being shut down. Um, If you can win the audience and stick with the audience, the politics will probably sort itself out. You've spoken very eloquently in the past about the idea of sort of the BBC as public space. So a kind of a space that is not mediated by governments or by commercial, but some some kind of hybrid in the middle, of which the, the UK has a number of different models. Um, uh, very interesting conversation with Lord Putnam last week. I mean, it's essentially the NHS arguably is a similar kind of model. It feels owned by the public, even though it's publicly funded. Um, to what extent is the to, to what extent does the does the the system need a critical mass of scale. It really gets back to this universality problem, which is that if you have to reach everybody, you have to offer something that everybody's going to want, which means by definition, you need a, a funding model that will fund that, which means you need to win the whole debate about the whole system needing needing to be in place. So to what extent is, if you, if you take other models, there are other public models of um, arguably the, PSB, uh, the, uh, the PBS model in the States, although different in some ways, where content, it's the, it's the difference going forward between content being available versus content actually being consumed. Because if it's going to be consumed, then the distribution platform itself and the brand that 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 represents needs to be sufficiently funded to actually have everybody come to it. Yes, I I, I accept accept that to a degree. I want to say that that I I think we we shouldn't jump to the conclusion it has to be as big as the BBC. As it happens, I think the, the benefits around having this kind of mother brand around many services across many media is it itself in the public interest? But the truth is, you know, in Germany, they went for, for two different broadcasters, um, public broadcasters, ARD, ZDF, and, and a whole s- separate system of, uh, uh, of, 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 of radio broadcasters um, and with very strong regional control, particularly of ARD. There, there, uh, you know, Channel 4 is universally available and actually has done, I think, a pretty good job of providing an alternative to the BBC um, for many, many different audience groups. So it's not obvious that you you, you end up with a monolith if you decide you, you want to have universally available public 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 content. Um, when people talk, it's not an idea I find very attractive of a a kind of a contestable license fee and the idea of a fund which could be spread amongst many broadcasters. They are they're they're, they're picking away at this 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 question about whether you need to have a kind of vertically integrated kind of broadcaster, commissioner, distributor, plus maker of content. And the, the, you could you could certainly certainly, certainly debate that. Um, to me, though, the, the issue is whether public space, and in particular, 
as it were, curated public space. So public space, which, although it's open to everyone, actually has got some boundaries around it, around um, intentionality um, uh, and around um, uh, protection uh, in terms of truthful content and and reasonable limits on content and, you know, suppression of harms and all the rest of it, whether that still makes sense. Um, what I feel is we've seen with the internet um, what un- uncurated Wild West public space looks like. Um, and actually, I think the arguments for management, to some extent, of at least... A, a kind of safe zone of public space have grown. Now, characteristically, the politicians and the policymakers currently are mainly focused on the extraction of bad, bad stuff. So, the the um, one of the many, many difficult issues, Mr. You know, my, my good friend Michael Gray is going to have to going to have to grapple with now is digital harms. Um, so that's a notion of a kind of negative process whereby you you suppress or punish the bad bad stuff. To me, though, you know, understood properly, public space could be something which is as much about what you the positive things you put into it as the bad things you take out of it. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm one of those people who um, um, I'm very struck Neil McGregor when he was. Um, running the British Museum used to talk about this, the, the, the notion in the 18th century of inventing a museum which, which was not just for London or even for the whole of the UK, but for the, for the world, for everyone, um, and which was going to be free for everyone in, on every human being to go to, and which was a kind of repository of everything that was interesting and good and important in, in, in all the civilizations of the world is that notion of that place with all these wonderful things in it is it's not about kind of excluding pornographic, you know, um, uh, uh, pictures from ancient Rome. It's not about the stuff you leave out because it's going to hurt people. It's what you put in it. And I think that positive um, uh, vision of public space is, is, is precious. And I think the, the, the internet could be the conveyance the me- method of conveying that to the public, but but the internet, kind of uncurated, um, is not going to deliver it on its own. I think we know that now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, there was a, a a quote that's coming back to me from a Charter and Ill document um, a long time ago. <laughs> this, is a kind of, <laughs> this is a this is a mental illness that many people suffer from who've been involved in those processes. <laughs> Normally at four think, o'clock in the morning. I yeah. know. I think this was a this was a, 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 a I think it was a Gavin Davis authored book of papers. Anyway, um, it, it I mean it, it it comes back to the kind of the flip side of the of the Rethian vision in a way, and it comes back to this kind of idea that you just think of talking about it in terms of the content space uh, on the internet. Um, but the quote I will misquote it, but the quote that, that rings a bell was um, uh, high quality content. Um, is a bit like education, which is that most people left to their own devices wouldn't buy as much as is good for them, which is fundamentally quite a patrician view um, of, of what the content should be. In the conversations we've had, there have, there have sort of been uh, two models that I think have fueled the debate uh, over the, 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 the course of the decades that you mentioned. One is you buy into the idea. So there is a, there is an idea. It's a bit, it, it's, it's sort of been at the heart of the social contract for a very long time. Um, uh, Lord Putnam last week talked about you know if you can make a case for for an intervention in public health, then you can make a, a, a case for an intervention in, in a sense, public mental health and the health of our democracy and culture and um, artistic endeavours and all the rest of it, of which PSB is a is a cornerstone. The other is you fill in the gaps, so you st- you you specifically solve for the bits that the market can't solve for itself, uh, because the market actually commercially will step up if there's, if there's a market for it and actually. The social piece of that, which is that not all of that content will get to people who can afford to pay, for, who can't afford to pay for it, uh, is that okay? Uh, is that broadly the two models as you see? And in that context, you, it strikes in that context, it strikes me that you are the the, the kind of the, the belief in the idea and the the ecology, the social contract model. And how did you go about making that case? Well, and the point is, I think you're you're, you're pointing at something big. This this comes, I think, comes comes down to a number of 
um, assumptions or beliefs about essentially about the public and about culture, which are probably to some extent, honestly, you know, um, there's probably some sort of, you know, bell curve or whatever around around people and some people have one instinct and other people have others. Um, um, my, my instinct, I mean, the, the, I, th- I think you're right in that the piece by um, um, uh, uh, Gavin Davis or one of his one of his writers um, is pointing to this puzzle of an information good that, that, that an information good you only know the value once you've consumed the 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 good um, um, uh, and so therefore consumers may um, miss miss as it were misvalue it misprice it before they've consumed it and therefore not consume it even though were they to consume it would do them good that, that I, I think having a kind of narrow um, model of mar- market uh, failure whereby you only you only provide the stuff that the market won't provide completely fails to uh, deal with the the information good problem and you know honestly what i want to say is that um i'm still and this may be old fashioned I, don't, I hope it's not too patrician it's probably patrician to some extent have have a view that um if you put good stuff out there um um, and make it freely available. You solve part of the information good problem by, in a sense, pricing it very low, um, which is what a license fee does. It prices very, very high quality, very low at the point of consumption, um, essentially zero at the point of consumption. Uh, that increases the chances people will will consume it. Um, um, if you've got very broad distribution, then word of mouth and, and, a, and a gathering um, um, a reputation you know, you put out uh, a new comedy, The Office, essentially nobody watches it. And the very few people who do watch it say they don't like it. Eventually, word of mouth turns it into a kind of classic hit. Um, so, so this process of people discovering through consumption and conversation is is something which can happen. But I, I, I'd freely admit I'm, I'm broadly optimistic that the public like quality and although they may start with preconceptions about difficult content or content which is going to be too heavy and not enjoyable, usually, actually, they're, they're very smart about listening and following and finding out what's good stuff. And the, the, but, but, the, the, but, but the truth is, it takes time. It takes a lot of upfront investment. And it does m- mean, quite often, putting quite challenging content in strategically important parts of a schedule or a service like iPlayer. And I think the the truth is most commercial players are more likely to want to, most of the time, provide more of the stuff that is already proven to work, i.e. the stuff which is not, hasn't got this quality of information good. It's, you know, it's Bridgerton Series 2, and it's which is great, by the way. Uh, 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 but you, if you watch Series 1, then you're going to watch Series 2 uh, as well. It's much, the, the, those instincts are much stronger in commercial media players. Um, newspapers who bang the same drum, not just week after week, but decade after decade, because it's known to work. It's doubling down on what their audience have already told them they like, they agree with, and all the rest of it. That kind of reflexive, safe commissioning is a fact in, in commercial media. It's very rare. The New York Times is a bit of a hybrid. It's a, it's a publicly quoted company. It's a, it's a for-profit company, but it's got very deep institutional cultural instincts as well. It's quite rare, I think, in the private sector to find that very altruistic, um, um, let's try this. We believe in it. We think we can find an audience for it. One of the things that's been remarkable, I think, over the course of certainly the last 20 or so years is the contours of the debate haven't shifted that much. If you go back, as I have recently done, and and kind of delve into Ofcom's very, very first PSB review, um, the highlights are there's a tsunami on the horizon, and Channel 4 is probably not sustainable, and the BBC licence fee, we're not quite sure, but the BBC should be experimenting with uh, probably some subscription services alongside a hybrid model for publicly funded other, elsewhere. And what what is that? That's 15, 20 years ago now. Um, and in a sense, that debate is is still there. To what extent were any of those conversations um, entertained internally when when you were DG around? Because I think one of the challenges here is if 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 we end up in a world of any sort of um, news education, current affairs, kids, 
we want that universal and free at the point of access. The rest, let's start experimenting with subscription. Forget about competition rules and all those sorts of things that come in. Actually, as an institution, can the BBC uh, get its head around that and, and learn to be a hybrid operator? And to what extent were, was any of that entertained in the past or was it all held at arm's length? Well, I, I think people often, you know, kind of sometimes don't look close enough at what was actually happening. UK TV uh, was a subscription um, uh, satellite and cable service in the UK, um, 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 which goes back many, many years now. Um, Kangaroo, um, which was the the idea of a global commercial um, streaming service alongside iPlayer, the domestic public service um, uh, streaming service, um, was an attempt to create a global subscription service, um, you know, which is exactly contemporary with Netflix as it happens. I mean, it's exactly the same period. The, the thinking and the technology inside the BBC, which is behind both iPlayer, which was launched, and Kangaroo, which was not, are contemporary with, with, with Netflix. Um, uh, those are examples of practical experiments. And I think the idea of leapfrogging into subscription, both domestically and internationally, on streaming services is one interesting way of looking through that. It, it's, it's quite a big thing, I think, um, to tell a broadcast audience, by the way, as it were, on average, an older audience, um, that suddenly you can't get Radio 4. Uh, uh, without paying some special subscription and getting a special device which can can accept a subscription. And it's not something which I think any government, UK government, is likely to ever want to do on radio. And honestly, I think it's unlikely they want, they're likely to do it with BBC One. And so I would say the BBC was actually thinking quite hard about, as it were, not, not the sort of, you know, frankly, pretty abstract uh, notion, the kind of policymakers you know, sort of modelling of this, but actually on the ground, can we learn about subscription through UK TV? Can we launch Kangaroo, by the way, with ITV Channel 4 and Channel 5 to try and and produce a really substantial global service? Um, It's steps like that, it seems to me, which could have or could still um, lead to deeper experimentation. But I think the idea that there's going to be a day when and some enormous lever is going to be pulled in Broadcasting House, or for that matter, in DCMS or anywhere else, and we're going to go from a license fee to a subscription service in one day, is 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 fanciful. I mean, the UK is a country which doesn't like change. Doesn't like change. Uh, uh, um, and, and which prime minister is going to stand up and say, actually, we're going to take all these things away, and if you want, you can pay more for them in this other way? I mean, it's it, it to me, it, it's a bit like you know, you know, you know, would, you, would would the UK be a republic? And you you hear people who will talk for hours about the, all the merits of 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 the country not having a monarchy and moving to a republic. But it's you think you know, back here on planet Earth, with so many other pressing issues, how likely is that it's ever going to happen? So. To me, it's going to be incremental, and it's almost certainly likely to be, as it has been in the past, experimentation around the edges, which might or might not grow into something. Um, um, I mean, what's interesting is, um, oddly enough, to encourage the BBC and Channel 4 to explore these things, you actually need an environment, a political environment, which is very supportive and is flexible and, 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 and which, as it were, these institutions can trust. Unfortunately, at the moment, these these topics normally come up in a kind of bullying, threatening way, which is largely done for tactical, you know, um, um, gain by the politicians involved. You know, you get a nice headline in the in the Daily Mail sort of thing. That's not the right way. If you're actually serious about trying to explore alternatives, it, I, I would just say, oh, we've seen that really since the 1980s, since the Peacock report. And it's been unbelievably self-defeating, I think, that kind of bullying approach. It's a, there's a, it strikes me there's a, there's a challenge in what you've just said. So the incrementalism of experimentation around the ed- edges and evolution, uh, does that sit comfortably with, um, again, going back to the Steve Hewlett lecture, uh, there isn't much time and you're not moving fast enough, and the experience you just had at the New York Times, which is that you actually need to throw... This is hard, and you need to throw everything at it if you're going to find a way through quickly. Well, so I think that's a fair point. Um, um, I, I do think, you know, there's there's some... You know, it, to some extent, the topic we're talking about now, which is about funding, is to some extent orthogonal 
to the to the question of audiences. Uh, um, it seems to me the public broadcasters could, could be doing a much much better job with their existing um, um, funding and their existing panoply of of TV in the case of the BBC Radio and 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 web and other digital services to flex and change what they're doing to meet audience demand. Um, there's no reason why you have to go on with so many traditional services and with so much power vested in linear broadcast services as opposed to content creation and generation for, 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 for digital. Um, so I think you could do a lot of that. But it, but it's true. I think you're right that, 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 that um, the other big unanswered question is how do you throw money at rapid change and to some extent – compete with people like Reed Hastings of Netflix, um, Disney Plus and, and all the rest of it, who have got billions of dollars of venture capital investment to throw into heroic change, heroic technology and all the rest of it. How do you compete with that? And that, I agree that, that that's an unanswered question at the moment. And uh, I mean, whatever it is, 10 years on from, uh, from Kangaroo, I still have those scars on my back. Um, we've still got whatever it is, four different public service remit broadcasters investing in their own technology. Um, why? Yeah. Is it, so so there's, a, there's a risk here that you've got, because we're, those have come from a, from a broadcast world defined by national, uh, national boundaries competing now against global pr- platforms. Why has it proved so hard to get those partnerships to work over the next 10 years? And do you think it's possible? Do you think it, the risk is there's a kind of frog in hot water problem and that and the people aren't moving fast enough? Do you think it's possible for, for, for kind of, the organisations themselves to do that, or is there a, a kind of framework moment that somebody needs to step in and say, actually, in order for everybody to compete and for UK PLC to compete, we actually need a new way of thinking about this? So the, 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 these are all, all, all very good questions. I mean, look, I, I think in my time at the BBC, we demonstrated that when it came to distribution, um, um, uh, Freeview, FreeSat, UView, the high levels of um, collab- collaboration were possible. Um, the successful negotiation between the BBC and Sky for for Sky to onboard the BBC iPlayer is another interesting example of what's possible. Kangaroo was obviously, in some ways, a, a, a kind of fairly visionary attempt to do something globally for the UK with all the public broadcasters, with essentially all the public broadcasters on board. So historically, it could be done. I think it's quite hard work, I'm, I'm here to tell you. And it, again, maybe it's not been a, as much of a priority as it could have been um, in the years since. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to lose sight of, um, well, I think the basic fact, which is if you don't do it voluntarily, you end up um, ultimately asking somebody else, almost certainly a politician, to try and from the outside kind of hammer something together which might work. Um, through institutional change, um, at which point you lose the, the the plurality of the different institutions and the kind of you know the the, the creative competition which comes from all of that or something. Um, so that 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 remains a an issue. I think the other basic issue, which is a, a frankly a systematic problem in the UK anyway, is underinvestment in 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 the digital future. Um, and 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 in the UK, such investment as there has been has been largely kind of you know digging holes in the ground to put fibre optic in. It's not been investment in digital product, in digital technology, to anything like the amount that that's needed. As a result of which, the UK essentially has no digital champions. Uh, uh, arguably, the whole continent of Europe. You know, you can just about squeeze Spotify in, I guess, one or two, but essentially has no digital champions and. You cannot have a fast-growing economy, it seems to me, without having a very, very strong position in digital. And so that's a national failure anyway. And I'm afraid the broadcasters are probably part and parcel of that broader failure of vision and and of sufficient gumption just to get the job done. Um, Israel has a better digital story than the UK does, even though it's a fraction of its size. In terms of what you've seen and as you look around the rest of the world, um, I mean, you've, you've, you've talked in some of your speeches in the past of, of companies like Shipstead and Napsters, Nap, uh, Naspers rather, who have who've come from small markets 
yeah. but, but have have understood and, gra- and grasped the opportunities of digital. To what extent do you think the criticism is fair that um, because of PSB being so central to the UK creative economies, essentially the internet has been a distribution platform rather than embracing all the other aspects of it that could be done, which others have? Well, I think it's... Look, I, I, I want to say, I mean, I think the risk for the... B- for, the, for, for, for Britain, for the UK, um, and, for, and for the BBC and Channel 4 and, and the other PSBs is, is that our broadcasting model, which was, I think, regarded genuinely as being one of the most interesting and creative in, on the planet. I mean, you know, uh, uh, particularly, frankly, by observers outside the UK were incredibly um, impressed by what the, the, what, the, what the UK achieved in broadcasting. The risk is it becomes like the British film industry which is capable of great work, but which is largely a wholesale um, talent operation hired out to, as it was in, in, from the, you know, the Second World War onwards, to big American players. I mean, so you know, other people come in with their money and they make, with our wonderful actors and writers and costume departments, they make fabulous pieces here. Um, so at one level, it's actually, it's, it's a sort of success story. But the economic interest the, the scaling, the brand recognition um, by audience, global audiences, all of that is lost because you're, you're, as I say, you're, 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 a, you're in a factor market. You're providing bits and pieces to help somebody else execute a creative vision, and that to me is the is 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 the real the real risk that we face that we 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 end up um, not really being in charge um, because we won't spend the money. Um, um, because we won't move fast enough and we're too high bound with our structures and our little regulatory games, you know, the, the, the way in which regulation works in the UK, which is, is honestly, you know, actually it's often well done. It's done by very well-intentioned people, but it, it often, its secret purpose seems, seems to be to slow down innovation and to limit risk um, in ways which, which are in the end are destructive, actually. Um, I can't resist the opportunity. Why do you think Kangaroo wasn't let through? Oh, I, I know exactly why it wasn't let, wasn't let, wasn't let through. And by the way, I, I think, look, narrowly, I've got some sympathy with this. The, the lens that the competition authorities looked through was the, was the television distribution market. And, and they felt that this global, united front distributing... Um, uh, British content uh, globally was um, likely to adversely or could potentially adversely affect other small independent distributors of of um, of, 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 of of television content. Someone selling documentaries in Italy might suddenly discover that the Italy was was flooded with this with subscriptions to this service, which meant that the other Italian broadcasters weren't weren't spending money on 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 uh, uh, on buying British content. Um, the, 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 the frustration is that, that that is certainly a market. It's a tiny, tiny market. And in the end, it was comparing apples with oranges. This was a direct-to-consumer um, uh, proposition at a time when um, it was clear to some of us that, that, you know, it was clear to me. I mean, I was talking to Reed Hastings quite a lot in 2007 8 that was the time when when we were working on the iPlayer and we were sharing technology and talking a great deal um i always thought netflix was going to be very big and i thought the bbc should i mean back to that bbc instinct that we should be out there uh, in everywhere we could and we should try and keep pace um but in the end we had an, a narrow in country and i think to be fair they were doing the job they've been set to do by government um and by the law, so I'm not suggesting there's anything improper in what happened, but it's when you hit um, a kind of local, you know, the 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 um, the local, you know, sort of, you know, trading standards officer is not happy with something which could be a, a world beater, um, but you know, you know, in 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 West Bromwich or whatever, there's somebody, who, you know, there's something about it they don't like, and it's got to go through its paces and blah blah blah. It, it's that. It, it's not wrong. It's just that. You know, it, this was a very, very potentially a very big thing that could have, that could have, in some ways, 
you know, provided something really dramatic and successful for the UK, which didn't happen. But I mean, you know, I, I, I don't want to say any more than that. No, that makes sense. I mean, there were, there were other conspiracy theories are available. <laughs> um, they are, I mean, I, I was pretty close to all that. I, 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 I and I'm not, I, I, I tend not to, I, I get conspiracy theories. I, I, I don't believe it was influenced by, you know, the Murdochs or anything like that. I think it's unlikely. Um, well, we'll we'll wrap up uh, with with a kind of a, a thought looking forward. Um, you wrote a piece for uh, for Lord Putnam's Public Service TV review, um, which would have been about uh, seven eight years ago, I think. Um, and the quote that sticks out is: uh, "Public service broadcasting will become more, not less, important to British audiences over the next decade." Political support for PSB is weaker than at any time in its history. This growing mismatch between the need and supply is the central problem in current broadcasting policy. Um, does that still hold true? Is my yes, first question. Yes, yes. No, no I think I I, I, I I still believe that. In other words, why why does the need become greater? It becomes it becomes greater because um, um, more and more of um, commissioning and consumption is to will will be to non-local players with non-local agendas cultural agendas um 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 uh, the news business particularly at local and regional level is going to be very very tough and so you start getting market failure the, the assumption that market failure was going to go away that that the digital was going to eliminate market failure exactly the opposite is turning out to be the case because it undermines traditional commercial business models um, i think we can see everywhere including the united states by the way that that we're seeing increasing strain in many aspects of commercial um, uh, delivery of our high quality content for example local and regional news so market failure grows the case, the theoretical case for public intervention grows, but the politicians are still basically singing from a hymn sheet which was written by Professor Peacock in the 1980s. If there was one thing as an industry that we should be doing right now to get ready for that and before manifestos start getting written and, and positions start getting boxed in, what would that be? And given in the past, these sorts of moments have seen some kind of intervention. You mentioned the Peacock Committee. Uh, others have mentioned, actually, why don't we trust the audience and put some citizen assemblies together? Um, what should the industry be doing right now to try and get ahead of the game? Well, to me, the most important thing is that the industry presents a compelling um, uh, vision of its own future. Um, in the absence of such a vision, um, policymakers will come up with something or they will you know, um, pretend to come up with something and really back back the status quo minus 5% or minus 10% or plus 2%. It's, it'll be the, the same old, same old. And, and so I think for the BBC and Channel 4 in particular, coming up with compelling ideas for how they're going to change and meet the challenges they now face is, is, is the most important thing they can do. And I think one encouraging thing is I have to say, I think both... Uh, the BBC and, and 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 Channel Four have got great leaders at the moment. I think they've got a, a, they've still got a lot of talent um, in both organisations, and I'd be confident that if they kind of seize the moment to to tell their own story to the public and to the politicians, you know, honestly, my own experience of these things is you come into the room with a plan. It turns out nobody else is actually everyone else has got a list of grievances or complaints. But nobody else has got a plan, and your plan tends in the end to 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 get through. Mark, thank you again for your for your time. You've been, as ever, very generous with your time and insights in this conversation. Uh, and I hope we'll hear more from you as the debates unfold. That was good. Thank you. So there we are. In Mark's view, the best way to stop things happening to you at a time of unprecedented change is to own the debate and come up with a plan. That's never easy. But it strikes me we've got particular challenges at the moment arising from our political environment and the lack of continuity arising from nine secretaries of state in less than 10 years. Which leads us neatly to our next episode where we hear from Lord Putnam, another influential figure from the last 30 years. He was one of the architects of Ofcom, a deputy chair of Channel 4 
and led his own review of the future of public service television back in 2015. He is a passionate believer that public service broadcasting should not be seen merely as a remedy for market failure, but more as part of the foundations of a civil society, critical to enabling social mobility and national unity, and informing democracy, and cultivating progressive values. Here's a little of what he had to say. I was, I was born 1941. The National Health Service came in 1945. I mean, I'm the beneficiary of an ex- explosion of extraordinary, really extraordinary, against the odds, social, social developments, free education, free higher education. To start, you, you want to start dismantling those, then you have to ask yourself, who, who are you? Am I someone who exists in order to consume the things that I want with the money I've got? Or am I someone who's a citizen and has a certain number of entitlements, which as a taxpayer, I realise I pay for centrally, but benefit from? This is, this is kind of massive stuff, John. It's not just about PB, it's not just about British uh, PSB. It's who, who we are as citizens in the United Kingdom. And will, the, and will the United Kingdom remain a United Kingdom? It goes that deep. You've been listening to Lens by British Screen Forum. My name is Pete Johnson, and I'm the CEO of British Screen Forum, where the best informed and most influential people in the UK screen sectors convene to interrogate issues of importance and influence policy and the thinking around policy. This podcast series is just one way in which we help our members frame the debate over the future of the UK screen sectors. If you'd like to find out more about our work or sign up for a future public-facing event, please visit our website at britishgreenforum.co.uk where you will also find an interactive timeline covering the key events, people and reports discussed in this series. Episodes in this series are released fortnightly and can be found on all major podcast platforms.